Welcome back to the Gnome Show, everyone. I am Josh, your humble host, and it is my duty, nay, my pleasure, to trawl the briny depths of YouTube so that I may bring you the shinies. I cover short films of varying genres, vi uh, video games, analog horror, and sci-fi, and really anything else that I find groovy. I hope, I really do, I hope that you'll enjoy tonight's offerings. And as always, content for the Blood God. <clears throat> On with the show. Tonight we have the philosophy of Hellraiser. Um, if you were an old fogey like me, uh, you remember the uh, the Hellraiser flicks, uh, one, two, and three. And um, uh, three was you know, okay, and four was kind of good for the uh, for the concept that it had. <laughs> but the ones after were mostly trash. Um, so, um, I really only subscribe to the first four if, uh, you know, if I can say, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, with that out of the way, we have the philosophy of Hellraiser, which, uh, the Morbid Zoo, go ahead and give them a sub and a like, is going to, uh, enlighten us on. So, um, let's check it out. Thank you for that phone. Among horror fans, Hellraiser is a bit of a touchy subject. Though Clive Barker's artistry as a director and writer and Doug Bradley's performance are considered unimpeachable classics, anytime Hellraiser comes up in conversation, it's always with the tone you might use to talk about, like someone whose promising modeling career was cut short by a devastating car crash. Oh yeah, I loved Hellraiser when it first came out. Really too bad about its face. This is made even more tragic by the sheer number of opportunities Hellraiser has had to find a good plastic surgeon, leave the painkiller behind and move on with its life. There are in total 11 Hellraiser movies, most of yeah. which are considered by most horror fans to be embarrassingly, irredeemably bad. A franchise as unrecognizable from its original form as if it had opened. A good portion of the Hellraisers after number four were like scripts cannibalized from uh, the other things uh, that just found its way into being called a Hellraiser uh, movie because they wanted to keep the rights uh, to the franchise which is the scummiest thing ever. Uh, and uh, it's why this franchise is, is where it's at. Yuck. In the lament configuration itself. Like, the Hellraiser franchise includes some of the straight up worst movies I've ever seen in my life. And I love trash. They're coming. They? The Cenobites. There are several videos on YouTube that recap every Hellraiser movie, rank them, review them, so I'm not gonna do that here. Instead, I wanna track what happened to make this franchise the hot trough of vomit that it is and what it could and should have been instead. Let's begin with some mind reading. That's right, I'm actually psychic. That's how I know that some of you just had the following thought. Oh, I know why the later movies suck. It's because the Weinstein Company was about to lose the rights to the concept. Their long-awaited remake was in development hell, and so a few of the movies were just made on like $2 and a Nokia just to keep their ownership of the intellectual property from expiring, what's known in publishing as an ash can copy. That is true, and it's certainly important to understanding the legacy of the franchise. But I think this gets an oversized amount of attention in Hellraiser studies. The Ashcan movies, which are 8, 9, and 10, are awful, but they're far from the only awful Hellraiser movies, true. many of which did have a budget. People got paid Very for true. this shit. The rights battle is a fun bit of trivia, but it glosses over what I think is the fact that all the Hellraiser movies suck, at least compared to the first two. This goes a lot deeper than just cynical studio behavior. There's an overwhelming... I only include three and four because um, they... Fuck, man. Fucking cats just have some fucking decency, man. Fuck. Ugh. Keep fucking just opening the door and walking away. Um, fuck. Yes. I say I, I, I include three and four because by and large, they are sticking to the canon lore or at least 
doing a decent job of the interpretation uh, of that of the source of the material of the franchise. Like I, I can watch them and like them for for everything that they are and aren't. Like you know what I'm saying. Like I enjoyed them as films, and the concepts behind them were sound, if a little half baked, but they were still like there. Um, the ones afterwards, you could t- like. I mean, Doug stuck around for as long as he could. I'll just say that. Feeling across the franchise that the people in charge of it after Clive Barker left just didn't get it. Almost like they were trying to make something in a language they didn't speak, Troll 2 style. And this extends to public understandings of Hellraiser 2, which kind of makes sense because the facts on the ground are weirdly not immediately recognizable as horror in the classic sense. Like the Cenobites aren't ghosts or a distortion of something normal like a clown or a scary child. They're not even really a metaphor like the Babadook. The premise of Hellraiser is this. There exists in the world a puzzle box called the Lament Configuration, sought after by hedonists looking for more extreme experiences, but sometimes stumbled upon by unlucky idiots. When you open it, these BDSM entities take you back to their dimension and torture you. That's it. That's all Hellraiser is. Oh, so they're demons. No. This is the sticking point for a lot of conversations about what Hellraiser means thematically, including, I have to assume, those that happen in studio boardrooms. And that makes a lot of sense. Angels to some, demons to others. Um, <clears throat> so, here's what Cenobites are to me. Um, and in the comics, the comic books have elaborated too. Like, they are <clears throat> minions of the Leviathan. It's not necessarily hell, um, uh, or is it uh, ascribed to be so? <clears throat> um, Leviathan is God of pain and pleasure. There is no distinction between the two. Um, you know, like they have distinct rules and uh, um, and organization uh, and hierarchy. Um, uh, the, the most famous one, the one that, uh, uh, that Pinhead is associated with is the Order of the Gash. I apologize for the language, but that's that, you know, like this is Clive Barker we're talking about. Um, and, uh, like they are, like they sometimes clash with or, or associate with other, uh, uh, cosmic beings, but they are not demons in the classical sense, as far as I know. It's because as visually interesting and disturbing as the Cenobites are, it's not immediately intuitive what they do. It's easy enough to get the idea that you solve the box and these things appear and torture you, but that leaves an important question. Why? The answer of any given Hellraiser director to that question is ultimately what determines how good their Hellraiser movie is going to be, and is central to why so many Hellraiser movies completely blow. Because for reasons we'll get into shortly, I think that if you ask the average person the question, why might a collection of weird-looking violent people hypothetically arrive to torture someone, the thing they're most likely to say is, that person is being punished. And indeed, this is how it works in most horror, and this is how it works in most Hellraiser movies. The movie happens, and then Pinhead arrives in the literal last scene to explain to someone the hell they hath created for themselves. And this is the hell you have created for yourself. This is made most... Yes, uh, so she's correct in, uh, in this, that a lot of uh, the later productions... Uh, <clears throat> they have Pinhead running around like... Uh, uh, like... Uh, punishing sinners and that is not what he does uh pinhead um it comes when he is called uh the box uh is how they are called this is how this is their test it is their uh you know uh i don't know how they uh, uh determine uh, uh the quality you know, like, you know, like it's, if you're, if you're, if you find the box, most times you're supposed to, uh, and when you don't, um, it's because you are very unlucky or, uh, you, what you saw 
awoke things in you that call the box. Um, the box is a very specifically designed uh, piece of mm, esoteric technology. Um, they have expounded on its creation uh, throughout the years. Uh, at one time, there was an actual art exhibit that uh, had pieces of, of, of that, uh, like, they were boxes, and they were different um, designs. <coughs> um, there's a guy um, on, um, on, online, on the internet, that actually makes custom boxes, um, and that shit is really fucking beautiful. Uh, there's all kinds of things, uh, but the box itself was created by a to uh, by a toy maker, um, uh, Le Marchand, <coughs> and um, he was uh, commissioned to make it. Um, and there are a lot of um, ways that it was, uh, you know, interpreted. But he made the box and then regretted it. And he also made boxes that could uh, uh, that could do the opposite. Like you know, it's it's very complicated, but there's a lot of lore behind it if you want to really dive into the weeds. But let's continue. It's explicit by the most recent Ashcan Hellraiser Judgment, directed with wholehearted effort by Gary J. Tunnicliffe, where the Cenobites are characterized as being literal demons presiding over a faction of a literally Christian hell. I'll give Tunnicliffe some credit for creativity. In a very fan fiction way, his version of Hellraiser does do some interesting world building. But this last Hellraiser movie before the 2022 remake exposes the mishandlings that happen when people generally try to make Hellraiser movies, which Tunnicliffe helpfully stated outright. I am in no way religious, but if you are writing a story that acknowledges the presence of hell, then you have to acknowledge the existence of heaven. Mm. Do you though? To be fair, Clive Barker does place the Cenobites in a Christian hell in the Scarlet Gospels, but that's not the case in the Hellbound Heart or the first two Hellraiser movies for which the Hellbound Heart was written as a sort of proof of concept. But this is important, so I want to emphasize it. The story Barker initially she wrote and adapted stuff. to film is hellish but it is not hell. And I think the role Hellraiser plays in horror culture reflects this. There are a lot of movies about demons, about Satan, about the Christian moral dichotomy, but there is only one Hellraiser. Hellraiser is special. So now that we've established that Hellraiser is doing something different, let's talk about some specifics. Clive Barker based his imagination of the Cenobites on what he personally saw during visits to BDSM dungeons during his youth, an interest that tracks throughout his work as a visual artist. Clive Barker's photography and drawings are full of images that, while not necessarily representative of sadomasochism, are certainly evocative of the aesthetic drama that sadomasochism is meant to inspire, the organic, warm, and soft, collide with the cold, mechanical, and indifferent. And that's really a pretty potent construction of the human experience, isn't it? How do we reckon our existence as beings with consciousness and agency, what some people would call a soul, with the fact of our weak, disappointing flesh prisons and its interaction with a world full of violence and decay? This is totally where the impulse for body modification comes from, right? If you've done any kind of body modification from makeup to plastic surgery, you live somewhere on the Cenobite spectrum. I myself have punched multiple holes in my head and carved several permanent designs into my skin, which is a pretty weird thing for an animal to do. Some animals decorate themselves for camouflage, but humans appear to be the only ones who willingly put themselves in a lot of pain to do so. There are two reasons this makes sense to do. One is as a matter of identity. You want to take control of who you are and be seen as something permanently new, more beautiful, more unique, a different gender. Nested within that, though, and what I think is arguably more interesting is the possibility that pain and the evidence of having experienced it is half the point. Ink box and clip-ons exist. There's no reason for anyone to get piercings or tattoos anymore. So why do we do it? Well, in my opinion, this has almost everything to do with the secularization of society over the past couple hundred years, specifically secularization from Christianity. Hi. Oh, come here. Oh, you too. Oh, 
Everyone's here. Uh -huh. Existence is pain, babies. The Christian Bible forbids any kind of mutilation of one's own body, which makes sense because the kind of enlightenment offered by Christianity involves intentional rejection of the physical world. You're supposed to turn all your thoughts to daddy and not involve yourself in worldly pursuits. Pagan cultures who incorporate scarification, tattooing, or other body modifications by direct contrast often do so as a specifically spiritual exercise, an intentional interaction with one's physical presence in the world and an acknowledgement of the suffering and obligations involved in having physical form. Spicy kitty. Frequently in tribute to some small G god of the earth, the sea, the sun, food, sexual maturity, some entity that has concrete effect on you and that you can see with your eyes every day. Can you not? Yeah, really. Honestly, this <laughs> makes more sense to me than trusting the word of some people who hear voices telling you everything's going to be fine if you just wait until you're dead, but I digress. But what all of these religious traditions have in common is an insistence that one way or another, the human condition involves a lot of pain. Abrahamic religions might frown upon tattoos and piercings, but in a lot of ways they still worship suffering. You're supposed to deny yourself most forms of satisfaction as a spiritual exercise, especially if you're anything but a Bush straight man. And oh, and let's not forget me. that the Christians symbol is literally an instrument of torture. And this seeps into our culture in ways we don't always recognize. For example, tattoos and piercings might be cool and fine now, but among the entrepreneur influencer crowd, I've recently been noticing Yo, a lot he of is to really make bitey. He wants the attention. New secular religion of the day. Stoicism is an ancient Greek philosophy that incorporates a lot of interesting ideas, but which today you can see most often boiled down to how you can best maximize your productivity <laughs> under capitalism, and the idea that suffering is not a fact of reality, but is in fact a result of your own misperception of your place in the world. Suffering is a story you tell yourself. It's been said that a wise Stoic philosopher can receive news of the death of a child and have no stronger reaction than if he were being told of the weather. And that's basically Christian behavioral expectations repackaged, right? Even if the engine running the behavior is using different fuel, they're in a better place. Don't worry, God has a plan. Everything after all, happens for a reason. The commonality in all spiritual traditions is that they all incorporate either a justification or a solution for pain. Arguably, pain is the root of all spiritual and philosophical thought because spirituality and philosophy are an interpretation of the human condition. And more than anything, the human condition is painful. The Cenobites take this fact to its is. most extreme conclusion. How you doing, viewer? Grim, nice to see you. severe logic. Uh, we're, um, talking about the philosophy of, or we're, we're being, cl um, well, she's got a lot to say and it's been very interesting. So I would definitely like, um, like watch from the beginning, uh, or catch it when I put it on, um, on YouTube, but, um, not only the philosophy of hell, but, or Hellraiser, but the philosophy of the human condition and a bunch of stuff it's it's very it's very deep and this this girl knows what she's talking about i like it i like it i dig it reflected aesthetically in the face of Pinhead that supersedes all these high-minded attempts to impose order onto an existence defined more than anything by chaos. In the Cenobites' understanding of the universe, sensation, including and especially the sensations humans instinctively try to avoid, is itself a god, which you can only really deny if you're in a position to think of yourself as safe from it. Part of the reason this pseudo-stoicism trend annoys me is because the hypothetical suffering these people talk about always seems to be completely divested from its context. Kids sometimes drop dead with no rhyme or reason, I guess, but more often something like killed them, right? In the Belgian Congo, people who didn't make their rubber quotas often got their hands and feet cut off. One of the most famous and harrowing photos from that era is of a father contemplating the severed hand and foot of his five-year-old daughter who was mutilated and then killed. I feel pretty correct in saying that that's a case where the structural integrity of your personal peace is pretty low on the list of moral priorities. If you can greet this photo with an air of beatific serenity, then I have another subject you may want to include in your study. <laughs> Nice. Pain Very nice. Never happens in a vacuum. Its effects, up to and including our feeble attempts to ignore it, ripple throughout human behavior. To a certain extent, it dictates everything we do. No matter how hard we try to deny or conquer our material reality, that reality continues to define us, possibly even more so the harder we try to run from it. So even though they act and look something like deep. We've discussed some of these subjects tangent or like uh, we've danced on some of these subjects earlier tonight in the stream.
demons, even though they're supernatural beings who cause harm on purpose. Words like demon and hell come with moral polarities attached that the Cenobites in their original form simply don't recognize right. and that they don't, don't accurately describe what they do. Since the beginning of storytelling, monster stories have functioned as a sort of talisman onto which we can project our understanding of where pain comes from. This understanding can come in a lot of different forms, but in storytelling traditions influenced by Abrahamic religion, religious structures, monsters always exist as an effigy, something we ritualistically burn as a confirmation of the eternal truth of the status quo. But because I'm an adult, I would posit that the existence of demons doesn't imply the existence of a one-to-one -one angel corollary. Not everything does happen for a reason, and I don't think there's an essential truth to which human experience can always follow like a North Star. What the Cenobites do is assume that this idea, that life has no intrinsic meaning or direction is not a malicious void, but a doorway into a new structure of thought. So let's play by their rules for once. Let's remove the idea that there exists sin and virtue and punishment and reward and really consider what we're left with. There's a YouTube video by CCK Philosophy that explores the philosophical structure of Hellraiser and in it, the idea of an agony that transcends into ecstasy is explored. George Bataille was a crackpot philosopher who was obsessed with this sort of thing. One day he came across some photographs of a condemned prisoner in China undergoing the Ling Chi execution, death by a thousand cuts, where the victim is dismembered alive. He was struck by the look on the prisoner's face, which wasn't of anguish, but apparent euphoria, an expression that would be more at home on the face of a saint in a religious painting. So what did he do? Well, he took those photos and framed them and hung them in his office so he could look at them every day. But I didn't do fuck? this because he was a sadist. We yeah. don't know for sure, I guess, but we don't have any evidence that he got pleasure out of suffering, sexual or otherwise. He did this because he thought he saw in those photos a glimpse of something in the potential of human experience that was unknowable by default, because to know it meant to reach a state from which it was impossible to return and explain what you saw. Bataille devoted most of his Fair philosophical enough. life to exploring the nature of these so-called limit experiences, events where the sensation you're experiencing is so strong that it starts to warp your previous previously held understanding of where the boundaries between diametrically opposed ideas like pleasure and pain and life and death really lie. So in uh, Warhammer 40k, Slanesh uh, and, uh, and her ilk, his her ilk, uh, uh, this is the, the philosophy that they follow. They're very much uh, like a, uh, the god of the Leviathan type thing. This is what the Cenobites are doing. So to really drive this point into the ground, since apparently so many of the people in charge of these movies truly need it spelled out, the Cenobites are not beings who worship pain because they love evil. They are beings whose theological order regards pain and transcendence as the same thing. If they were just demons who love evil, they would have no principles, no rules. They would be chaotic little havoc spreading freaks, the opposite of the structured, yeah. measured form of thoughtful study that defines the clergy of all religions. In fact, they'd be exactly what they start to be in the third movie, Hell on Earth, where the Cenobites are set loose in the city. Whoa! That's a wrap. But that's oh. counter to everything the Cenobites stand for, because they are... So, as as a young person, I thought, like, you know, like, uh, well, I, like the, the Cenobites coming out of the bar and everything was kind of cool, but, you know... I mean, sometimes I still I still like the third movie. I can't like say that I didn't because it was imaginative, but it did step away from the original concepts of the first two movies heavily structured, they are measured, and they are thoughtful. They are a specifically religious order. That's yeah. what the word Cenobite means, a member of a religious organization. So to project them in a Christian setting removes wow. any of the bite from what makes them disturbing, which is that they are attempting to reach for a sort of perfection that we, as beings who naturally avoid pain, are incapable of ever achieving. In moments they would be here, the ones Kircher had called the Cenobites, theologians of 
of the Order of the Gash, summoned from their experiments in the higher reaches of pleasure to bring their ageless heads into a world of rain and failure. At its best, Hellraiser kind of looks more like folk horror, cult horror, than body horror. What's scary is the question of the degree to which the Cenobite's spiritual organization might be reflective of truth, or at least reflective of a force so overwhelming that it's indistinguishable from truth. What if sensation, the things that we can tactically perceive and which in some way arrange all our experiences, are the only true source of knowledge? What if all you really are is a collection of nerves? This is one way to understand Hellraiser, and it does accurately explain the levels of sacrifice made by members of certain religions. Monks who mummify their bodies as they're living, for example, or the Catholic saints, many of whose holiness is directly associated with suffering and personal sacrifice. But whether limit experience are actually real is a matter of philosophical debate. Matai's preoccupation with Ling Chi- I did tell you, I, I, I did, that we would be, dis, um, this would be heavily, heavily a philosophy um, stream tonight. So, yeah, um, it is getting heavy. She seems to have left out a pretty important part of that punishment, which is that the suffering of the victim was not really the point for a variety of reasons, religious, practical, and humanitarian, oddly enough. And so people subjected to this kind of capital punishment were often, maybe always, drugged which means that the exalted look on this poor soul being executed might have had something to do with the probability that he was, at the time, on a lot of opium. But more to the point, I don't think that understanding limit experiences heavier. and how they're illustrated in Hellraiser is necessary to get what Hellraiser is doing or defines the parameters of what it could mean. Part of what I try to do every time I sit down to analyze something is figure out what its appeal is. Why did people like or not like this thing. And I don't think that Hellraiser connected with so many people because it's a meditation on limit experiences. Most people aren't interested in limit experiences. I'm certainly not. I'm good with all my skin attached to my body, thank you. Yeah. Frank, in the first movie, is arguably interested in limit experiences, but Julia, the original intended antagonist Clive Barker had in mind for Hellraiser and the person on whom all the drama of the first two movies turns, isn't. She just regrets her life choices and wants to dick down with her hot brother-in-law. Accordingly, we have in the possible interpretations of Hellraiser two main levels of analysis, unless you want to be a child and focus on how Pinhead fits into the kingdoms of the Christian hell. How many angels can dance on the heads of the pins on Pinhead's head? The literal interpretation is the one we just went over, an exploration of the idea of limit experiences. The broader interpretation, the one I think holds more subconscious appeal, might be described as an exploration of a sort of metaphorical limit experience, a kind of horrific reversal of the same hero's journey story that some scholars think provides the groundwork for all stories in human history. What if you come back from your journey changed and enlightened, but unrecognizable to yourself and everyone you know? These are the questions available in Hellraiser that interest me, because through them you can start to come up with the kinds of questions the Cenobites themselves might be trying to answer in their experiments. How much of you has to be physically taken away before you are no longer yourself. If you put somebody else's skin on, are you still you? If not, what kind of being are you? So by another avenue, the more salient metaphor for Hellraiser is not evil, but change deliberately crossing the threshold past which you will in ways you can't yet predict cease to be yourself and become something different. What did you like? Joyful notes without change, without end. Heaven, there's no music in that. BDSM is a pretty genius way to express what the Cenobites do. As I touched upon before, as kinks go, BDSM is a pretty sophisticated one, because so much of it relies on a kind of aesthetic that has almost nothing to do with sex. In the novella, The Hellbound Heart, Frank is as horrified as anyone by the Cenobites' appearance. He had expected something different, expected some sign of the numberless splendors they had access to. He had thought they would come with women, at least. He would be exalted by his lust instead of despised 
prized for it. But no, no women, no size, only these sexless things with their corrugated flesh. He expected pretty ladies. But as Julia knows, satisfaction and euphoria are more complicated than that. Boning down with your hot brother-in-law might be the activity she's pursuing, but that's not what she wants. What she wants is a fulfillment so strong that it'll justify, at least in her own conscience, the violence she's being asked to commit. And we do this both on an individual and societal level all the time. The death penalty, for example, is a form of murder we commit societally, basically entirely for emotional satisfaction. On smaller scales, there are forms of damage we inflict on ourselves and others to reach a greater, more transcendent, more spiritually complete satisfaction constantly. That's something that the Hellraiser franchise, though it introduces the concept, sometimes has a hard time writing itself around. Hellraiser as a franchise has to have a curiosity killing the cat formula because this is a horror movie and no one but kooky George Bataille wants the Cenobites to show up at their door. But that means that there's a big narrative hole in Pinhead's statement that the Cenobites are demons to some. <laughs> angels to others. I don't think the newest Hellraiser remake is perfect, but there's a lot to love. And one of the things that I think it we'll absolutely it. nails was the casting of Jamie Clayton, a trans woman, as Pinhead. That's a pretty genius bit of metatextual storytelling that in my opinion really nicely introduces is. the pleasure aspect of the Cenobites that's missing from almost all previous films, including the first ones. We see evidence of the most invasive and irreversible sensory pain, but where's the corollary? What about intimate and indescribable sensory pleasure, like touching your baby's face for the first time after an agonizing birth, or the peace of, say, a body that matches your gender, a process that often requires no small amount of painful modification. And lest you think I'm being a groomer lib cuck by saying that, you can flip this around too, for what is the agony of gender dysphoria compared with the peace of knowing God made you in his image and has you in his loving embrace? <laughs> See? Sensation is the god that supersedes all gods. Whether you avoid pain or accept it, its presence defines your life. The idea that Hellraiser as a universe supposes is that the most extreme human experience, agony and euphoria, are woven into each other because all forms of agony and euphoria require you to accept the fact of your physicality. That you are on this earth now, in physical form, and are thereby subject to the authority of its chaos. Barker came of age during- Oh, again, something we touched on earlier tonight. Like, that's- it's interesting. Like, uh, I, like, often I do try to have, like, a theme for my streams. I've said this before, and I really like it when it naturally happens. Um, so, yeah, this is pretty cool the height of the AIDS epidemic, which means his identity and understanding of queer culture, especially as it relates to gay men, is in some ways impossible to divest from pain, alienation, and death. His understanding yeah. of pleasure is intimately connected to taboo and a certain seedy underground, a way of life transformed into something physically dangerous by the dominant heteronormative culture of the time through its very assumption of homosexuality as spiritually dangerous. Clive Barker is some Sometimes compared to H.P. Lovecraft and his creation of old gods and forces indifferent to daily human society, In some respects, but I don't yeah. think that's entirely right. In fact, though I love H.P. Lovecraft, I think that he and Clive Barker are basically doing opposite things, quite possibly because of another opposition between the two, True. which is that Clive Barker is part of a community that is hated, while H.P. Lovecraft was very much part of a community that did the hating. H.P. Lovecraft is saying that the also universe true. is indifferent at best and quite possibly malicious, that the horrors of the world are external, a byproduct but their their views are polar opposites of this you know what i'm saying like they're, they're like they're both extreme views uh, of like of their world you know hp lovecraft was absolutely afraid of everything uh and um uh, and <clears throat> um um dude uh hellraiser I can't, uh, clive barker comes uh, you know from uh like a uh, you know a background where everything was dangerous to him and the experiences that he craved were uh taboo and uh dangerous and terrifying and and uh connected to like a uh, like evil uh as far as like the people around him were concerned like not his community but the you know the outside world um so yeah it's it, and if you ever seen nightbreed 
that's also like a um a, a very intimate depiction of the same idea where you know like you have this place that is safe for you until people find it uh and then they burn everything to ground um so yeah, they're they're the the views there though they are completely opposite. They are they are outlooks examining the same you know world view, like you know their perception of the world and everything that scares them and intrigues them and drives them to do what they do. It's mostly for what, like like it's it's everyone. That's all of us. You know there there are reasons. That we do the things that we do, whether they be conscious or unconscious, like uh, like uh, the attitudes and the um, instincts that we carry with us, uh, and that you know, like assist us in our everyday. Like this is this is what these are core parts of them. You know, like how you view the world in regards to yourself. You know, um, if you're an only child like me, it's you versus the world you know what i'm saying like you know like you know like like i had no like a um it was just me you know it was uh, you know, like I, I you know i only had to worry about myself um and that informs everything that i do now and there are a lot of habits that i have to uh break uh because like i'm i um i'm not alone anymore um but like there are a lot of ways that like i operate in the same fashion like you know like i'm on my time not anybody else's i don't know of humans being just another animal on the planet destined for eventual ruin. Barker, on the other hand, tells us that far from being a matter of incomprehensibility, the horrors of the world come from human consciousness, from our very singular ability among animals to make a moral hierarchy out of an amoral existence. This is important, maybe the most important thing to understand about how Clive Barker writes when we're looking at a story like Hellraiser. Because the way Clive Barker and everyone in his generation and before were forced to relate to any kind of non-heteronormative sexual impulses they had was as a secret, a sin, a sign of the chaotic abyss lurking under the thin crust of your public persona. Being a member of any kind of counterculture means that all culture becomes strange by default, and therefore, counterintuitively, easier to see with clarity. When Clive Barker tells a story about a giant penis monster that indiscriminately slaughters a bunch of peaceful denizens of the British countryside, but avoids menstruating and pregnant women, he's not telling us about cosmic horrors beyond human comprehension. He's telling us about a very specific human horror that we have become blind to, not because it's been designed that way by archaic external forces, but because of how it's been woven into the banal, the quotidian, how the history of how human beings have treated each other comes back in the present in ways we don't expect and can't prepare for because we can barely even describe it ourselves. That is, after all, why we invented monsters to begin with. Not as a totem we can destroy to tell ourselves everything is going to be fine, but as a representation for layers of meaning we just don't have the right words for. Something we can show other people when the myths of how the world is supposed to be ordered fall flat, and the best we can do is make ourselves known to each other through a collection of symbols, like hieroglyphic stand-ins. Like, no, the way I feel about the world can't be described, because it's all feeling. And I can't transfer that feeling into you, but I can kind of let you look at it. And what pain looks like is this. this. Zoo, ladies and gentlemen, uh, hell, uh, philosophy of Hellraiser. Lots and lots and lots to digest in that one. Um, 
Uh, yeah. Um, I like just about everything that Mr. Barker put out. Like Lord of Illusions was really good. The book, um, the movie kind of hit it and missed it at the same time. Um, um, like all of his stuff is good and you can tell that he is literally, you know, you, you can, you can feel him in the pages of every fucking story he writes, not just like his characters. You can feel him because these are, he's translating his experiences and trying to get you to understand what he's like had to deal with. And, uh, yeah, I got midnight me train was a fucking epic little story too. I like that cause it, uh, I like those like dark little, um, stories with, uh, their own mythology, um, and, you know, contained in, you know, <clears throat> yeah, Scarlet Gospel, I've heard about that. Um, I want to see the, the 2022 movie cause I heard like, uh, that rendition of Pinhead was really good. Um, and like, if you, if you, if you've read, uh, like descriptions of Pinhead, like it's very much like more like the new, uh, the 2022, like Doug Bradley was awesome. And he also had that, that, um, uh, androgynous look, especially in the first couple of films, which, uh, you would expect of a Cenobite, which I didn't know that they were like, uh, they, they were basically another word for clergy, you know? Um, but, uh, that, that was wild. Um, I, I, I read a lot of like, uh, the short stories, uh, from Clive Barker, like, uh, cause I used to be, I used to be on the go a lot. God damn, man. Can y'all just fucking stop, stop. One second. Let me put some music going on. Because I'd be ignoring my phone while I'm doing this. And I gotta. Uh... I just, uh, I, I thought it was really cool, um, Eric, that, that, um, the, some, some of the topics that we were discussing earlier came up in this video, um, and, like, it, that's really, I, you know, I like it when it comes together like that, when it was, as Hannibal would say, um, I like it when a plan comes together, um, that was really good. Like, subscribe, share, everyone. Uh, I'll see you in the next one.